I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh thank you to the Manhattan Institute. Hi, I'm Paul Singer, uh, Chairman of the Manhattan Institute, and I'd like to welcome <clears throat> the people that started applauding, applauding our, my clack. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to the 24th annual Riston Lecture. The Riston Lecture is the Manhattan Institute's premier annual event. It's become a gathering through which we recognize some of America's greatest public intellectuals, allowing them to present their thoughts on the challenges we face and the opportunities we have to apply timeless principles to the issues of our time. I should add, as I said at last year's dinner, that this event is the enemy of the soundbite, the anti-Twitter, and a bracing ant antidote to our attention deficit disorder culture. In 1948, Richard Weaver, who taught English at the University of Chicago, wrote a monumental book called Ideas Have Consequences, and the title itself has made its way into our political lexicon. What is left less often remembered, however, is the opening line of Professor Weaver's work. Quote, this is another book about the dissolution of the West, close quote. Weaver's thesis was that the West in general, and America in particular, had lost its bearings, that it, had be it, that it had become alienated from fixed truths and was experiencing the loss of ideals. Professor Weaver's book, in short, was deeply pessimistic. Too pessimistic, as it turns out. America not only didn't dissolve, it eventually triumphed over Soviet communism and many other maladies. The reason, as Weaver himself would have understood, is because ideas have consequences, and good ideas have good consequences. That, in a single sentence, goes to the core mission and purpose of the Manhattan Institute. We believe good ideas can make a world of difference in people's lives. We've seen that proven time, again, time and again over the centuries, over the decades, and even over the last year. Consider just a short abbreviated list, including the remarkable first few months of Governor Christie's term in neighboring New Jersey. <laughs> or the national discussion on education sparked by the film <clears throat> Waiting for Superman, which I highly recommend seeing. <laughs> or the number of en energetic reformers running for federal office and in state capitals across the country, preparing to tackle bloated state treasuries, uh, sorry, bloated state bureaucracies, unfunded, <laughs> right. <laughs> Was that Freudian? <laughs> uh, unfunded pension liabilities, governments on the cusp of insolvency, and high under, uh, unemployment and underemployment. But governors, mayors, and lawmakers require intellectual and political policy streams from which to drink. And that is just what the Manhattan Institute preeminently provides. Just as importantly, the Manhattan Institute is willing to marshal research and analysis against bad ideas. With that in mind, I want to make a special mention of a new book by Manhattan Institute's senior fellow, Steve Malanga. <laughs> author of Shakedown, The Continuing Conspiracy Against the American Taxpayer. Steve argues with an abundance of evidence on his side that we're witnessing a momentous transformation of the fundamental structure of American politics. He shows how public sector unions and government financed community organizers are wreaking ruin on our private sector economy. But Steve's book is merely illustrative of what the Manhattan Institute does on a yearly basis. It's but a single link in a golden chain. The Manhattan Institute remains what it has been since its founding, 
directly engaged in the most important intellectual battles of the day. Now please enjoy your dinner. Dessert this evening comes with a lecture by one of America's greatest and most influential legal minds, the Honorable Samuel Alito. It is truly a great privilege for me to be able to introduce Justice Alito. Even before he took his seat on the Supreme Court, Samuel Alito was widely viewed as one of the best legal minds of his generation and one of the most prepared people to ever be named Associate Justice. He brought an extraordinary breadth of experience to the High Court. A graduate of Princeton University and Yale Law School, Justice Alito has worked as a federal prosecutor, as an assistant to the Solicitor General, and in the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel. In 1987, President Reagan named him the United States Attorney for the District of New Jersey. And in 1990, at the age of 39, President George H.W. Bush nominated him for the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit where he served with d distinction for 15 years. When he was nominated by President Bush in 2005 to serve on the Supreme Court, he had more prior judicial experience than any Supreme Court nominee in more than 70 years. But Justice Alito brought far more than simply experience to the court. He also brought to it enormous integrity. Throughout his life, Sam Alito, has shown himself to be a person of grace and humility, of composure and decency, and of fairness and civility. If you ask Justice Alito, he will tell you that he still vividly recalls that day in 1982 when he argued his first case before the Supreme Court. He still remembers the sense of awe that he felt when he stepped up to the lectern, and that sense of awe has never left him. Is it inspired, it is inspired not simply by the imposing and beautiful building in which the Supreme Court itself is housed, but because of what the institution stands for, equal justice under the law. Samuel Alito has shown an unbreakable commitment to those five words. When I was a first year law student in the 1960s, freshly scrubbed and awakening enlightenment from the immense minds at Harvard Law School, I will never forget the day, only a few weeks in the term, into the term, when I sat back in my chair listening to Professor Paul Freund and said to myself, my goodness, they're making it up as they go along. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Samuel Alito does not believe in making it up as he goes along. And he and his small band of like-minded justices are a critical and much appreciated bulwark of our freedom. Samuel Alito is a model Supreme Court Justice. Please join me in welcoming him this evening. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you for the very warm welcome and uh, thank you, Paul, for the very kind introduction. How's that? Is, can you hear me okay? Getting a little feedback from <clears throat> my dual microphones. It's a great honor and a privilege for me to be able to, to speak to you tonight. I must say, however, that um, I was both flattered and not a little bit daunted when I saw the list of prior speakers at the Riston Lecture. As Paul mentioned during his comments earlier this evening, they include uh, some very renowned academics and intellectuals, and I am neither of those things. I have been a judge for the last 20 years, and judging is not an academic pursuit. It is a practical activity. Uh, I think that we uh, practice a craft, and the judges learn primarily from experience and from the example of others. And so I'm going to try to talk to you tonight from that perspective. The title of my talk, as you, can, uh, as you may know, is Let Judges Be Judges. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, for some time, our country has been engaged in 
a pretty hot debate about the proper role of judges under our Constitution. And the debate rages on today, but it is curious that the contending sides in this debate have had great difficulty articulating exactly what they want judges to do. It is sometimes argued, for example, that judges should be strict constructionists. That was once a very popular phrase, but my colleague Antonin Scalia has argued, and I think quite correctly, that a law quote should not be construed strictly and it should not be construed leniently, it should be construed reasonably. Now, another term that was once prominent was the term interpretivist. There was a time when a number of prominent constitutional scholars identified themselves as non-interpretivists, meaning that they did not think that constitutional decisions should be based on an interpretation of the Constitution in any conventional sense of the term. But the phrase non-interpretivist also appears to have fallen out of favor, and indeed a Law Review article published in 2000 proclaimed, quote, we are all interpretivists now, so no more non-interpretivists. Similarly, there was a time when originalism, the theory that the Constitution should be interpreted in accordance with its, ori its original meaning, was scorned. Justice Brennan described it as little more than arrogance clothed as humility. But about 10 years after Justice Brennan's speech, Ronald Borkin, who had never previously been identified as an originalist and certainly is not a conservative, said, quote, we are all originalists now. And then there's the term judicial activism. Once upon a time, this was a progressive badge of honor. Now, however, both the left and the right seem to agree that this is a term of derision. During the recent confirmation hearings for Justice Kagan, for example, Democratic senators took the opportunity to lambaste recent Supreme Court decisions with which they disagree as activists. And so we have a very strange phenomenon. We have a heated debate about the role of judges, but no accepted vocabulary that defines exactly what the fighting is about. This terminological confusion, I submit to you, is not a superficial phenomenon. Some years ago, a former colleague of mine on the Court of Appeals, uh, who is incidentally, I think, one of the smartest judges I have ever known, participated in a panel discussion at our mutual alma mater at a class reunion at Yale Law School. My former colleague's career path was by no means typical for a Yale Law School graduate. It began, he began his practice in a small community and he represented ordinary individual clients, small businesses, local government bodies, uh, and other clients on a wide range of inter uh, matters. Now there was a time when even the typical Supreme Court justice began his legal career with a practice of this type, but that day is long past. In any event, during this panel discussion at Yale, my former colleague was asked about judicial independence, and this is what he said. Quote, this is going to shock everybody, but I have to tell you something. I am very good at reading wills and telling you whether or not the trust provisions violate the rule against perpetuities. I am very good at reading charges to the jury to make sure that the judge charged correctly on proximate cause and whatever else may be. I am very good at reading affidavits to see if there is probable cause for a search warrant. I am not so good at running institutions. I am not so good at changing things in society. If you are going to talk about judges who want to take over institutions and make far-ranging changes in our society, they are no more entitled to be free of criticism and attacks than is the President of the United States. So if you are going to act like judges and you are going to make decisions like judges, you are entitled to judicial independence. But he continued, if judges do not act like judges, their independence will be threatened. Now, I quote this comment because of the seemingly mundane phrase, if you are going to act like judges. 
My former colleague, whoa, with his background uh, as a practitioner, who handled the sort of matters that have provided the everyday fare of our courts for generations, assumed that this phrase, if you are going to act like judges, would be easily understood by his audience. What should judges do? Well, of course, they should act like judges. Now, does this seem simple-minded? Well, if it is, then the framers of our Constitution were simple-minded in the same way. Our Constitution is a very lean document. If I were to read the entire text to you tonight, it would take me about 30 minutes, about the time of my talk. By contrast, if I were to read to you the, the unratified Constitution of Europe, it would take 17 hours. <laughs> the brevity of our Constitution is a virtue, and it helps to account, I think, for its longevity. But because the Constitution is so lean, some important things must be inferred, and one of these is the framers' view of the proper role of judges. Article three of the Constitution creates the federal judicial system. It creates the Supreme Court and authorizes Congress to create lower courts if it cho so chooses. But Article three does not say very much about how any of these new federal judges are to go about their duties. Article three says that the federal judges are to decide, quote, cases and controversies, but it does not define those terms. In some countries, a judge can start a case on his own if he wants. Does our Constitution permit a federal judge here to do that? And once a case is begun, what procedures are to be used? As originally ratified, the Constitution was largely mum on court procedures. Provisions of the Bill of Rights subsequently imposed several procedural requirements for criminal cases but really only one specific procedural requirement for civil cases. And the way that right is defined is instructive. The Seventh Amendment guarantees the right to a jury trial in certain, quote, suits at common law. The right is thus defined by reference to proceedings in the courts that preceded the adoption of the Constitution. This is significant. Before there were federal courts, there were state courts. Before there were state courts, there were colonial courts. Before there were colonial courts, there were the courts of England. American independence plainly required some alterations in, tradi in judicial traditions. Whether the framers fully understood the extent of the modifications that would be necessary is an interesting question. But I think it is clear that they contemplated that the broad outlines of past practice would be continued. We can see this, I think, pretty clearly in Federalist 78, the chief paper in that series that is devoted to the federal judiciary. Written by Alexander Hamilton, who was a very experienced and a very fine practicing attorney, Federalist 78 assumes that the new federal courts will follow the doctrine of stare decisis. Now, for the non-lawyers in this room, this is the distinctively Anglo-American doctrine that each judicial decision creates a precedent that is binding on the court in future cases. And as the lawyers in the room will also appreciate, this is not some insignificant legal technicality. Think of any of the hot button questions that the Supreme Court has decided in recent years. It is ob obviously a matter of considerable importance whether when future cases arise, the court's decisions in those, dis in those areas are absolutely binding or presumptively binding or not binding at all. So this is a matter of some significance. In Federal 78, Hamilton attempted to allay the fears of those who thought that these new federal courts were gonna run amok. And he said not to worry, they will not be able to run amok because they will be, quote, bound down by strict rules and precedents. Now, why did he think they would be down, bound down by precedents? There is nothing in the Constitution that addresses that issue. Indeed, one can argue that the very 
concept of a constitution which is a supreme law and therefore takes precedence over ordinary legislation is inconsistent with the application of the doctrine of stare decisis in constitutional cases. The argument to that effect has elegant simplicity. It goes as follows. The Constitution is the supreme law whenever there's a conflict between the supreme, law, the supreme law and a lesser form of law. The supreme law must prevail. If even a statute must uh, yield when it is inconsistent with the Constitution, how can it be that an incorrect judicial interpretation of the Constitution can prevail over a correct interpretation of the Constitution? The best textualist answer to that argument, which I accept, is that Article III's grant of, quote, judicial power to the Supreme Court and the lower federal courts implicitly authorizes them to continue to follow with appropriate modifications the pre-existing doctrine of stare decisis. In other words, the framers used the phrase the judicial power uh, to, to signal a continuation of past practice. They used it in the same sense in which my former colleague on the Court of Appeals used the phrase, if you are going to, be, if you are going to act like judges. They assumed that there was a common understanding of what judges did, and there was no pressing need for further elaboration. Well, if we want to recapture the prevalent understanding of the judicial role at the time of the founding, a good place to start is with William Blackstone's. William Blackstone. William Blackstone's Commentaries on the Law of England, published very shortly before American independence, was enormously influential in this country. Edmund Burke said on the eve of the revolution that the book had sold almost as many copies in the North American colonies as had been sold in England. Uh, and uh, the distinguished historian Daniel, Daniel Borston has described Blackstone's commentaries as, quote, the Bible of American lawyers. Borston sees Blackstone's project as an effort to defend the English common law in terms that would be attractive to an Enlightenment audience. As portrayed by Borston, Blackstone was a patriotic Tory who thought that the English common law was the best possible legal system imaginable. But writing in the late 18th century, Blackstone could not defend that system in the romantic terms that would have been very acceptable just a few decades later, as happily irrational and organic growth not to be tampered with by meddling mechanical reason. Instead, he had to show that the laws of England were just the kind of laws that men trained in scientific reasoning would devise. Blackstone has been seen as painting the judge as a sort of scientist. A scientist analyzes raw data and thereby identifies pre-existing but previously undisclosed laws of nature. Similarly, as seen by Blackstone, a judge analyzes prior judicial decisions and customs and identifies legal rules. This brings us to the first model of the judicial role that I want to note, the judge as scientist. This was the one that is identified with Blackstone. Now, it was not long after Blackstone published his commentary that this model was subjected to withering criticism from Jeremy Bentham and others, and nobody today thinks that the old common law judges were simply finding the law. So as a legal theorist, Blackstone does not get very high marks. But as a practical matter, Blackstone's description of the, the role of judges had beneficial effects. For Blackstone stressed that judges should not base their decisions on their own predilections, but should look outside themselves for guidance. In his introduction to his commentaries, Blackstone states that the judge's job is to determine the law, quote, not according to his own private judgment, but according to the known laws and customs of the land. Now, a judge who believes that he is merely 
finding the law. They well end up making the law incrementally. But such a judge is less likely to strike out boldly in a new direction than would be the case if the judge thought that it was legitimate for him to exercise bald lawmaking authority. Despite uh, Bentham and other critics, Blackstone's influence in this country was profound and lasted for much of the 19th century. Abraham Lincoln, for example, recommended that anybody embarking on a study of the law should begin with Blackstone. But the latter decades of the 19th century saw marked changes in American legal thought. Before this time, the law was more or less a self-contained craft, with most lawyers obtaining their training essentially as apprentices in the offices uh, of established practitioners. By the late 19th century, however, training began to shift decisively to law schools. Now, at one time, many of these schools were standalone proprietary institutions, much like the technical institutes that today teach students things like information technology and criminal justice. But eventually, almost all of the law schools became associated with universities. And in the university-affiliated law schools, the use of Blackstone's commentaries dwindled. In 1881, another very famous book on the common law appeared. This was Oliver Wendell Holmes's The Common Law. Influenced by social Darwinism and pragmatism, Holmes rejected Blackstone's discovery theory of the law, the theory that the common law judge was simply finding the law. As Holmes later put it, his view was that, quote, the common law is not a brooding omnipresence in the sky, but is instead a human creation. In other words, the common law judges were not discovering the law. They were, in the words that Paul just uttered a few minutes ago, making it up. Now, the recognition that common law judges were making the law incrementally and perhaps in many instances without actually realizing exactly what they were doing does not lead inexorably to the conclusion that the law in general or even just constitutional law in particular is fundamentally indeterminate. But some thinkers have slid all the way down that slippery slope. In political science, for example, the predominant model of judicial decision making is the so-called attitudinal model. And this model is predicated on the view that what Supreme Court justices do when they decide cases is simply to attempt to maximize their own policy preferences, nothing more and nothing less. The implications of this model for lawyers and judges are, of course, profound and unsettling. If justices are simply implementing their policy preferences, then all the elaborate legal arguments that lawyers make are irrelevant. If the lawyers think that their arguments matter, they are sadly deluded. If they know that their arguments are beside the point but make them anyway, they are co-conspirators in a massive fraud. And, and what of the judges? What of the justices? They are impresarios of an elaborate and expensive deception. Now, not surprisingly, this attitudinal, attitudinal model, which is taken as proven by the great majority of political scientists today studying the courts, is less popular in the law schools, for if the model is correct, then much of what the law curriculum uh, features is also a very expensive fraud. Nevertheless, the idea that the law is radically indeterminate has its adherence among law professors. And I'll provide you with one quick example. And this concerns comments made by a judge in an event that was not open to the public, so you're just going to have to take me on my word that this occurred. Uh, when a new federal judge is appointed, the judge is sent to something called baby judge school, believe it or not. Uh, if the judge is appointed to the district court, there's a fairly extensive period of instruction, presumably on the theory that district judges really have to know how to do a variety of things. If the judge is appointed to one of the courts of appeals, 
the course of instruction is much shorter, presumably on the theory that Court of Appeals judges don't really need to know that much. And if somebody's appointed to the Supreme Court, there's no instruction whatsoever. <laughs> But at the end of baby judge school, the, the judges go to a dinner at the Supreme Court. And at one of these dinners, a newly appointed judge, now I, I, once upon a time I was a prosecutor and I would make reference to confidential informants. So I'm going to refer to this judge as a, sort of a confidential informant because I'm not going to disclose his or her identity. But uh, the confidential informant judge gave a little talk about what he or she had learned during his or her first few months on the federal bench. And I swear what he or she said was the following. And this judge had previously been a, a law professor. What he or she said was one of the things, the main thing that I've learned is that words matter, contrary to what some of my former colleagues thought. <laughs> the words in statutes matter. The words in judicial decisions matter. What a quaint, old-fashioned idea. Let me return now to the year when Holmes's book, The Common Law, first appeared. That was the year 1881. Within a year of that date, two other better known books appeared. And I think both were influenced by some of the same in intellectual currents that found expression in Holmes's work. One of these was Nietzsche's The Gay Science, which marked the first appearance of the famous phrase God is dead. The other was Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov, which gave rise to the perhaps equally famous aphorism, if there is no God, then everything is permitted. Now, for present purposes, we can paraphrase this aphorism, which is attributed to Dostoevsky, and say, if there really is no such thing as law in the sense of fixed rules that are independent of the philosophical or policy predilections of the judges, then judges are permitted to do whatever they please. Well, what then is a judge to do? And this brings me to the next conception of the judicial role that I want to discuss. And this is the, the vision of the judge as a constitutional rubber stamp. The idea that judges are simply making up the law is obviously very troubling for somebody who believes in democracy. We are a fundamentally democratic society. Our laws are made by elected representatives of the people. Federal judges are not elected. If judicial decisions simply represent judge-made law, how can we possibly reconcile the practice of judicial review with our fundamental democratic commitment? A very interesting and important question. And James Bradley Thayer, a Harvard Law School professor from 1873 to 1902, provided an answer to this question. And Thayer's answer was that, except in the most extreme circumstances, unelected judges should not override legislative decisions. Thayer said that a law should not be held unconstitutional unless no rational argument could be made in favor of its constitutionality. Now, if that is really the standard, is the Supreme Court ever justified in holding that a federal statute or a state statute is unconstitutional if even a single justice thinks that it passes constitutional muster? Or, to go a step further, is the Supreme Court justified in striking down a federal law or a state law if even a single judge on any of the lower courts thinks that the law is constitutional? The answer must be no, unless, of course, one is prepared to say that the justice or the judge who defended the statute was not simply wrong or clearly wrong or grievously wrong, but utterly irrational. Since 1937, something like Thayer's approach has carried the day in cases involving much social and economic legislation. But what about cases presenting issues under one of the provisions of the Bill of Rights or the 14th Amendment? What about laws restricting the freedom of speech? What about laws that discriminate on the basis of race? 
Thayer's argument applied across the board. But before World War II, the major constitutional issues concerned economic and social legislation, and therefore application of Thayer's hand, hands-on approach produced progressive results. During the 1950s and the 1960s, however, the focus of constitutional litigation shifted to non-economic rights. Should Thayer's approach be retained in those areas? Probably the most famous circuit judge of all time said yes. The judge was Learned Hand, who sat on the federal bench here in Manhattan for nearly a half century. When Hand died in 1961, a front page editorial, a front page obituary in the New York Times called Hand, quote, the greatest jurist of his time. Now, Hand was a man of decidedly progressive sentiments. He fervently believed that the pre-1937 Supreme Court had abused its power by striking down economic and social legislation under the Due Process Clause. He agreed with the subsequent decisions holding that such legislation should be sustained if it has any rational basis. And he saw no basis for applying a tougher standard to legislation challenged as violating one of the provisions of the Bill of Rights. He condemned such a, quote, double standard. Taking this view, he disclosed in private correspondence that he disagreed with the Supreme Court's decision in Pierce versus Society of Sisters, which struck down a state statute prohibiting parents from sending children to private schools. He disagreed with Meyer versus Nebraska, which prohibited the teaching of the German language in a state statute that prohibited the teaching of the German language in the public schools. During the famous Scopes Monkey Trial, he told Walter Lippmann, the longtime editor of the New Republic and a close friend, that while he deployed the, he deplored the Tennessee statute prohibiting the teaching of creation in the public schools of the state, he thought the statute was constitutional. According to Felix Frankfurter, Hand agreed with Frankfurter's opinion in the Gobitis case, which held that a state could prohibit students who are Jehovah's Witnesses uh, from refusing to salute the flag, even though doing so violated their religious beliefs. And in a very famous lecture that he delivered at Harvard Law School in 1958, he went so far as to criticize the Supreme Court's reasoning in Brown versus the Board of Education. This is where the view of the role as a constitutional rubber stamp led Judge Hand. <clears throat> now, with the decision in Brown versus Board of Education, we are in the Warren Court era, and that brings me to a third view of the role of the judge, and this is the judge as reformer. Two descriptions of the work of Chief Justice Earl Warren illustrate this vision, and I offer these portrayals for that illustrative purpose and not necessarily uh, because I endorse their accuracy as a picture of what the former Chief Justice thought. The first description was provided by Anthony Lewis, who for many years covered the Supreme Court for the New York Times. Lewis wrote that Warren, quote, made no attempt in opinions or otherwise to propound a consistent theory of how a judge interpreting the Constitution should approach his task. Lewis stated that Chief Judge Warren, quote, evidently felt unconfined by precedent or by a particular view of the judicial function and instead sought simply to find the just result. Similarly, G. Edward White, a professor at the University of Virginia Law School and the author of an excellent and sympathetic biography of Warren, writes that Warren, quote, conceived of the Constitution as the embodiment of values that he believed in and as the basis for granting him, as a judge, power to protect those values. The ethical imperatives that Warren read in the Constitution, I'm still quoting Professor White, were so clear to him and his duty to implement them so apparent that matters of doctrinal interpretation were made simple 
and matters of institutional power became nearly irrelevant. When Warren's personal values actually coincided with the Constitution, as was the case in the Brown decision, this approach produced magnificent results. But by the end of the Warren era, scholars who were previously sympathetic questioned whether the Warren court had gone too far in imposing its values on the Constitution. Scholarly criticism of the Warren court prompted an enormous growth in books and articles on constitutional theory. And this brings me to the next understanding of the judicial role that I want to note, and that is the judge as theorist. I previously mentioned that the big change in American legal education that occurred in the latter part of the 19th century, the shift from what was essentially an apprenticeship system to the growth of the law schools coincided with a change in thinking about the nature of law and the Constitution. And in recent years, American law schools, at least many of them, have changed again. I'm, I'm reminded that at one time, there was a definite hierarchy of genres in painting. I think this was established by a member of the French Academy in the 17th century. History painting occupied the highest rank, followed in order by portraits, scenes from ordinary life, uh, landscapes, and still lifes. And therefore, an artist like Turner at the end of the 18th century, the beginning of the 19th century, had difficulty obtaining admission to the Royal Academy in England because he was a mere painter of landscapes. Well, in the law schools today, there is a similar hierarchy, and the highest rank clearly belongs to the theorists. When I entered law school way back in 1972, constitutional law was viewed as a subject to be studied on its own terms. Constitutional scholarship was seen as carrying on a learned conversation with the courts, and in particular with the Supreme Court. And the conversation was conducted in terms that judges and lawyers could understand. Since then, however, constitutional scholarship, like much current legal scholarship, has become increasingly theoretical and interdisciplinary. Here's a little fact that I think may be telling. During the 40 years from 1930 to 1970, Immanuel Kant was cited in about 123 law review articles. During the 40 years from 1970 to 2010, he was cited in more than 6,500 articles, an increase of 8,000 percent. From 1930 to 1970, Hegel was cited in 91 articles. During the following 40 years, he was cited in more than 3,000 articles. Now, I think it suffices to say that few federal judges select Kant or Hegel as their favorite bedtime reading. But today's judicial theorists expect judges to perform feats that are truly Herculean. And here is an example. Ronald Dworkin, who's often identified as one of the leading legal philosophers of the day, creates an imaginary figure to describe what an ideal judge should do. And what does he call this character? Judge Hercules. <laughs> judge Hercules is immensely wise and extraordinarily learned. Judge Hercules has plenty of time to decide every case. In Dworkin's view, there is always one right answer in every case, and Judge Hercules always gets the answer right. And Judge Hercules does this by taking into account every relevant aspect of the country's legal system and identifying the decision that best fits the country, uh, excuse me, best fits the legal system as a whole. It is an understatement, I think, to say that Dworkin expects quite a lot from Judge Hercules. And I am afraid that any real judge who tried to emulate Dworkin's model would suffer a fate similar to the one that befell the real, which is to say, the mythological Hercules who died after putting on a poisoned robe. I'm happy to report, however, that few federal judges are likely to collapse under the strain of trying to live up to the example of Judge Hercules. To a great and an unfortunate degree, 
practicing lawyers and judges have simply tuned out much of what the legal academy produces. Now, some of you may be familiar with a publication called The Green Bag. The Green Bag bills itself as, quote, a quarterly journal devoted to short, readable, useful, and sometimes entertaining legal scholarship. This tells you a lot about other law reviews, <laughs> which are presumably, uh, which feature articles that are presumably interminable, unreadable, of no practical use, and never entertaining. A few years ago, the, the Green Bag ran a parody piece written by a professor at NY law, NYU Law School called In Defense of Theory. The, this piece takes the form of a fictional memo from a law professor to the other members of the faculty. And the thrust of the article is that legal theorists should boldly accept the proposition that outsiders, including most especially judges and all practicing lawyers, are simply not worthy to read what they write. The memo urges the faculty members to proudly embrace the idea that they are writing solely for themselves. There's a lot of truth to the parody, and the increasing insularity of legal scholarship is something to be lamented. Now, today's judges may not spend very much time reading law reviews, but they cannot entirely shut out what is said about their work in the popular media. And this brings me to the next view of the judicial role that I want to discuss, the judge as crowd pleaser. I rarely read newspaper editorials about the cases that come before our court, but at the end of the term a couple of years ago as an experiment, I decided to collect all of the editorials that had been written about our cases in some of the country's leading newspapers, and I searched those editorials for any that drew a distinction between what the Constitution or a statute requires and what the editorial writer thought was a desirable outcome. And I came up almost empty. Virtually every editorial simply commented on whether the outcome met with the editorialist's approval. Interestingly, one of the best editorials I found was one that was critical of an opinion that I had written for the court. And what the editorial said was, we like the result that is produced by Justice Alito's opinion uh, for the court, but we just don't think that is what the statute means. And if I were going to give a prize for an outstanding editorial, I would give it to that editorial, because it drew a distinction that is critical and is too often forgotten. The Constitution does not always mean what we would like it to mean. The statutes that Congress enacts do not always mean what we would like them to mean. That is exactly what we mean by the rule of law. The popular media, unfortunately, often obscures this fundamental point. Here's another example. At the end of this past term, the New York Times carried a big article about our court under the predictably ominous headline, Robert's Court, the most conservative of all time. If you read the article online, you could participate, and you can still participate, in an interactive quiz to see, quote, how your views align with the views of the Roberts Court. Participants are asked questions such as the following. Would you favor or oppose a ban in your state on abortions performed late in the term of a pregnancy, also called partial birth abortions? Now, if you respond that you would favor such a ban, a ban, the screen immediately informs you that, quote, you agree with the Supreme Court and most Americans, 73% to be precise, and the pictures of the five justices who voted in Carhart, uh, in Gonzalez versus Carhartt to uphold the constitutionality of the federal partial birth abortion statute are highlighted. On the other hand, if you respond that you would not favor such a ban, you are told that, quote, you disagree with the Supreme Court and most Americans. Of course, the whole thrust of this question is fundamentally at odds with the traditional understanding of the judicial role. The issue in Carhartt was not whether the justices personally favored or opposed 
a ban on late-term or partial birth abortions. The question was whether the federal statute violated the Constitution. The New York Times quiz question obscured this critical point. Well, while the creator of the New York Times quiz may not appreciate the difference between what the Constitution means and what one might like it to mean, ordinary people still do get this critical distinction. The assault on the traditional idea of the role of judges began more than 100 years ago. But ordinary people stubbornly hold on to some old-fashioned beliefs. And one of these is the idea that the Constitution means something. Statutes mean something. And the role of a judge is to interpret and apply the laws as they are written. Asked whether a judge should apply the law as written or do what the judge thinks is fair and just, two-thirds of those polled said, apply the law as written. That's what we mean when we say we have the rule of law and not the rule of men. We need to preserve that idea. Judges are not scientists, and they should not be constitutional rubber stamps. They have no warrant to, impo to pursue a reform agenda that is not grounded in the Constitution, and they should not aim to be theorists or crowd pleasers. Let judges be judges, for if they are not, our legal system as we know it will fade away. Thank you very much. Make sure everybody hears the question. <laughs> Justice Alito, my question is nothing to do with um, judicial philosophy. It's a more mundane question. It's a calendar question. Will you attend the State of the Union <laughs> this year? <laughs> I said in my talk that judges learn primarily from experience and from <laughs> the example of uh, those with greater experience. For many years, the more senior members of the Supreme Court, Justice Stevens before he retired, Justice Scalia, uh, stopped the practice of attending uh, State of the Union addresses because they have become very political events, and they're very awkward for the justices. Um, we have to sit there like the proverbial potted plant most of the time, <laughs> and uh, we are not allowed to applaud, or we are not, those of us, those who are more uh, disciplined, uh, refrain from <laughs> manifesting any emotion or opinion whatsoever. <laughs> And, and that's sometimes very, it's sometimes very hard because presidents, I've been there when President Bush was addressing um, a, a Congress in which the Republicans had the majority in both houses and when the Democrats had the majority in both houses. I was obviously there when President Obama gave uh, a couple of State of the Union addresses. And it, the, it, presidents will fake you out because they will, there's certain things that a president will say that everybody has to applaud. So. The president will say, isn't this the greatest country in the world? Well, if you sit there like the proverbial potted plant, 
you, you look like you're very unpatriotic. So you get up and you start to clap, and the president will say, because we are conducting a surge in Iraq, or because we're going to enact <laughs> health care reform, then you have to immediately <laughs> stop. It's very awkward. So I doubt that I will be there in January. <laughs> Justice Alito, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I may, by the way, if you'll allow me to sign my program with uh, It's Not True. I'd appreciate <laughs> it. But uh, you were very diplomatic in your uh, talk about sort of ascribing a lot of the philosophies that you articulated in your lexicon to law professors and others. But I think uh, if, if one has read any of the opinions of a lot of your colleagues, I think many people here would say that uh, there are many make it uppers as they go along, many crowd pleasers, and many of the other uh, phenomenons you described among your uh, eight other colleagues. Is that uh, fair and is that, um, <laughs> is that uh, it, it, given the fact that there are uh, a, a lot of them, uh, what does that do to the goal that you articulated of trying to preserve the notion of, uh, of rule of law over rule of uh, arbitrary uh, decision? Well, Paul said, uh, I think very aptly, that ideas matter, that ideas have consequences. They really do have consequences. And I think that an, an effect of a lot of the incredibly uh, voluminous writing about constitutional theory that has poured forth since the time when I was in law school has been to convey the impression to a lot of people, including both judges and practitioners, that the Constitution can be, mean, can be made to mean whatever they want it to mean. Uh, it's simply a matter of manipulation. It's a very dangerous idea that, is, that has taken hold, both in, in the legal academy, and not that many people, I think, read a lot of what's written in law review articles today. But these, article, these ideas filter down from the law reviews to more popular media. Uh, they are inculcated in law students who become clerks to federal judges and Supreme Court justices. They get a hold in, in, the, legal, uh, in the legal profession, and they have a very, they have a very deleterious effect. I think it's, it's critical for alternative voices to be heard in the law schools. I see Gene Meyer here. I think the Federalist Society does a fantastic job at providing an alternative voice in the law schools. Publications like uh, City Journal provide an alternative voice on public policy issues um, and, and help to counteract um, the, the spread of uh, a lot of bad ideas, including uh, the ideas about the, what the Constitution means and the rule of law and, and what law means that I, I tried to describe in my talk. A couple of more quick questions. Yeah, um, I, w I wanted to p pick up on I thought your excellent point about the uh, understanding of the difference between what's, what's, uh, what's good policy and what is constitutional or not constitutional. And you expressed optimism about the, uh, the, the American people in general in terms of that. Um, is there anything uh, that you, th you think in general can be done to, to encourage or increase that, that knowledge, other than obviously giving a speech like this certainly helps, but do you have any overall thoughts about how to increase that, the awareness of that critical difference? Uh, yeah, what's, what, is what students are taught about the Constitution and about the courts in high school courses matters, what they are taught in college courses matter. Each year, thousands and thousands of students take 
political science courses on the Constitution. I took one when I was in college. I think almost every college teaches a course, has a course like this. A lot of students who are thinking about becoming lawyers take the course. A lot of other students uh, take the course. And if they are told in these political science courses that all Supreme Court justices do is to maximize their own policy preferences, and we can prove this scientifically, uh, that has an impact on it has an impact on future lawyers. It has an impact, probably more important, on the broad citizenry. So that's very important. The way the law is covered in the popular media is very important. And all too often, as I tried to say in the talk, the suggestion is made that there isn't really any difference between what the law means and what you want. Um, the, the quiz that I, the quiz question that I. I mentioned is a perfect example. It, in, it entirely conflates those two, um, those two uh, separate concepts. And of course, what students are taught in law school makes a lot of difference. Now, they're not, not every law professor teaches students that the law is radically indeterminate. It really doesn't mean anything. Decisions are more influenced by what a judge has for breakfast than by the law. But the idea is, is there. And all of these are pernicious. So, the, 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 uh, these ideas need to be combated at, at every level. Just uh, all things considered, is it a gain or loss that we no longer seem to have people like Goldberg, Warren, and uh, James Burns, that is to say active politicians nominated to the court? Uh, that's a uh, it, that that's a question for presidents. The background of uh, people who are appointed to the Supreme Court. Um, the the comp the the professional backgrounds of the justices today are quite unlike uh, the the backgrounds of the justices at previous periods of time. And why that is so is an interesting question. Uh, you'd have to ask the presidents who made the nominations. At least one president, I think, exercised really good judgment in making. <laughs> At least, at least one <laughs> nomination. But I think someone can be an excellent Supreme Court justice from a variety of backgrounds. But if someone was previously uh, a member of the Senate, and a lot of former Supreme Court justices were, just to take one example, or the governor of a state, uh, the person has to make a mental shift of gears upon entering the judiciary. And lawyers are generally pretty good at doing this. They, they change jobs, they perform a different role. But if you were, if you were a governor and you become a Supreme Court justice, you, you cannot perform your, judge, your, 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 your role as a justice as if you were still a governor, as if you were still an elected policymaker. So you have to, you have to act like a judge. You can't act like a governor anymore. You can't act like a senator anymore. You can't act like a law professor anymore. Or a prosecutor or a government lawyer or a defense attorney or whatever you were before. You have to shift gears and perform the role that judges are supposed to perform. Well, I want to thank uh, Judge Alito for a very worthy Riston lecture. I'd like to thank Paul Singer for making this all possible and thank all of you for your continued involvement and support. <laughs>